Well, good morning, Southside Bible Church. <clears throat> we get to worship through the Word of God now. That's been my prayer this week in studying. Moses is going to ask in the passage that we're going to look at, he's going to say, God, will you show me your glory? And his glory is going to shine, and it's just the goodness of God, the godness of God, the freedom to do as he pleases, to not get counsel from humans, but to act for his own name's sake. And I'm just praying that we would all see that glory this morning and that we would worship praise coming from the heart of every believer in this place and that we would offer up our bodies a living sacrifice to God, the obedience of faith for his name's sake. Uh, That's what I'm shooting at and asking God for this morning. I've been thinking much about this section of scripture. and, And again, Paul said, this is the good news of the gospel. And so what we're studying in Romans 9 through 11 is good news. It is God's news of the saving gospel. And so I was thinking about uh, the illustration of climbing. Any climbers in here? Um, I'm not one of them. But I have climbed one 14er in my life. And so I feel like I'm just speaking from real life experience (laughs) up here this morning. And when I was hiking, I thought I finally got to the top. Uh, And and then I looked up and, and there was another peak higher. And the view was so beautiful from where I was at. And I was just tired from hiking it, like two years of Romans 1 through 8. And we get to Romans 8, 31 through 39, and you just say, can it get any more beautiful that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? I'm done. There can be no higher beauty. And Paul says, "Uh uh-uh, there's a higher cliff. And we need to get to the Mount Everest of Revelation. And then close with doxology to the glory of God. And so now we are finishing this last ascent, climbing the freeness of the salvation that has come to us from a God who is unhindered or coerced by anything in us. Just free, pure, sovereign grace poured out on unworthy, incapable sinners. That's where Paul's been journeying this whole letter. So keep climbing with me. We're on some treacherous, there's a lot of cliffs going up to this last part. You could fall off on either side. Fatalism, hyper-Calvinism, there's just all kinds of junk that we can fall into. But the views are so lovely that I'm asking you just come with me and let's get to the top of Mount Everest and worship together as a church. So let's go to our God and pray. Father, as we continue hiking, I pray by the revelation of your word that your spirit guides us into perfect truth. God, don't let us stray to the left or to the right. Lord, we are looking at um, some amazing, amazing truths. And so I pray your spirit delights to glorify the Son, and the Son delights to glorify you, O God. And so I pray this morning that you would be put on display, that every heart now would just be worshiping at the end of this service of our God. And so, Lord, meet us and do what only you can do. For your name's sake, I pray. Amen. Turn to Romans chapter 9. The outline we've been looking at is there was an accusation made in verse 6. Paul says, it's not as though the word of God has failed. He's looking at this promise that nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Well, What about Israel? It sure looks like the promise has failed with them. And so the accusation is God can't keep his word and what he promises to do. There's an axiom in our second point in verse 96b, for they're not all Israel who are descended from Israel. And so God begins to show now his plan is working perfectly according to what he has decreed. Nothing's off, nothing's out. God is, it's not this external nation that he's showing that I'm going to get children uh, in his argument is the third point in verses 7 through 13. By my sovereign grace, this whole nation has been formed by God's free choice. This is how God has chosen to get his children in this covenant of promise. They're children that he makes and not we ourselves. We can't birth ourselves into the kingdom of God. You must be born again or you will not enter into the kingdom of God. Abraham was an idol worshiper, and he's called out by God by sovereign choice. Then he went to Isaac and Ishmael, 
And so Ishmael's 13 years old. He had been fathered by, by Abraham, and Hagar was an Egyptian bond slave. And so the question was, why did he choose Isaac and not Ishmael? And he says, I, I, I choose Isaac because you're 100 years old, Abraham. She's 90. You can't get children at 100 years old and 90. Doesn't happen. And so God says, that's how I'm going to get the child of promise. I will be the one who gives birth to this child. And then the question was, well, no wonder he didn't pick Ishmael. He's from an Egyptian bond slave. And then we began looking at Jacob and Esau. And God chose Jacob in the womb and not Esau. <laughs> he said before they were born or had done anything good or bad. God's choice was made in the key phrase in verse 11 is so that God's purpose, according to his choice, his election, would stand. And so God is the one showing that the only thing that works with my sovereign grace and my glory is if I choose and I save and I do all of it, and man adds nothing and brings nothing into this covenant of grace. And so he wants you to, to not miss that, that, that nothing else would work with God's desire and plan for his glory alone except election. No other way. This is the marriage that God has brought about in his purpose. <clears throat> and so the richness, I just want to re-preach that. Does anybody want to go through it again? I'll, I'll take you through it again. But we're going to move on this morning. Accusation, axiom, the argument. And now this morning, we're going to take up the antagonists. And there's going to be two of them, two questions that he'll take on in verse 14 and verse 19. And so I've always said, when you throw a brick into a pack of dogs, one of them is going to yelp. And many tend to yelp at this teaching. It's hard. Eternal decrees. There's just so many things in this passage. And I just have so much compassion to journey and talk and study and pray with you and just ask God, God, is this who you are? And not say, God, this is what you must be. And so we're working together to say, God, you tell us who you are. Don't get that flipped. Your elders and many in this church uh, can love and journey with you in these truths. If they're new to you and you're struggling with them, let's come, let us reason together in the word of God. And I said at the beginning, if you wrestle in the word and come up with a different conviction on this and still believe in justification by faith in Christ alone, I will love you and give you the right hand of fellowship and shepherd you till I die. And what is more, I believe that me... Believing this truth and still struggling with pride and in the right kind of gratitude and thanksgiving, I have enough to keep me busy the rest of my life. I will never look down on anyone. I just want to see the view from Mount Everest. I want you to come with me so that you can feel the joy of this chapter. That's the motive of my heart. That's what I desire for all in this building this morning. I remember the first time I saw the Grand Canyon, I'd seen pictures <laughs> But when you go, it's a different experience. And for a moment, my knees are shaken, and Ken Murphy didn't exist. And that's what's happening far deeper in this chapter. If we could be taken up with the godness of God and his glory that he's going to reveal this morning, we'll be on our way to healing a million different struggles in our lives. I, I find as a pastor, the way to heal our struggles and our battles, just look at God. And when you get caught up in that, there's healing for a million different things that you've walked in here with. And so I'm praying for those who are depressed, discouraged, struggling. I, just look this morning, and you're going to find healing for your soul. What some of you need this morning is all of your problems and hurts and battles and trials is to stare into the glory of God and to be taken up with him. So I'm not stalling. I'm not... Verse 18, so he has mercy on whom he desires and he hardens whom he desires. I'm not stalling. I really am going to get to that. I'm not afraid of it. Um, <clears throat> we, will, we will look at that. But I got so lost this week, we're not going to make it to verse 18 until next week. So, sorry. But I, I bet at the end you're not going to be disappointed. You're going to be like, way to park on that. Okay? So let's look at the outline <coughs> of our first antagonist. If you'll look with me then in uh, Romans 9. 14. What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. Is God unjust in doing it this way? Choosing whom he desires without taking into account what we do or say? 
Paul says, may it never be. And then he's going to quote two Old Testament passages, and you'll see them in verse 15 and verse 17. And they all start with the word for, which means my argument. I'm going to defend the statement and why. And he's going to bring up Moses this morning. Next week, he's going to bring up Pharaoh in verse 17. If you'll look in verse 16, then he concludes, so then. It doesn't depend on the man who wills, the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. Conclusion. Look at verse 18. So then, he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. So Paul's going to bring us these arguments and his conclusions from the verses that he quotes. If I had to outline it further, I would say verses 15 through 16 are Jacob I loved, and verses 17 through 18 are explaining Esau I hated. And so the justification of God for both of these choices is what Paul will now begin to work through. <clears throat> so what we look at this morning is really important, like the foundation of the whole Bible. We started this chapter on the truthfulness of God, on the faithfulness that, that has started this whole section with Israel. Can God not keep his promises? And Paul is saying, you better believe that he keeps his promises. And that's the argument. And now in the middle of that, he drops another major foundation this morning called the justice of God. The justice of God in choosing whom he desires to save. And so now we're looking at the faithfulness of God and the justice of God. So these two big foundations Paul's defending in this chapter. So what is, the, what is causing the antagonist this morning to say, unfair? It's not that God chooses people. That's Israel's whole history. That's been their boast. That's been their crown. We're God's chosen people. They never struggled with election for their nation. They, they loved it. They boasted in it. God chose them. You only have I loved of all the nations. They loved election. But what they're struggling with is the basis that God makes this election. And that being independent and irrespective of anything in man. And then when that happens, it brings out the cry, unfair. That's unjust. And Paul's answer is one that we've seen throughout this letter. Meganoito or genetai, <laughs> it means no way, perish the thought. It can't ever be true. It, it means don't let your mind even begin to move in that direction. When it comes to God choosing whom he desires in salvation, Paul says it's just. And God declares it to be just. Paul, you better be able to defend that. And defend it he will by quoting just one verse. Uh, I was ready for a whole chapter, maybe two chapters, uh, on how to explain this. And he gives you one verse. And, and I thought, this verse better be good. And it is good. Paul is going to show that God is righteous, which he's been doing throughout this whole letter. Do you remember the, back to Romans 1.17? In this gospel, uh, the righteousness of God is revealed. So in this gospel reveals God's righteousness, his justice, his rightness, and how he acts with his creation. The whole gospel declares that. The Old Testament is filled with the righteousness of God. Justice, he says, is his throne. He tells us his ways are just. All his ways are right. The psalmist says, I love his righteousness. It was just who God is. It was his attribute. Paul wrote earlier in Romans 3, 3, what then? If some did not believe, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God, will it? May it never be, rather let God be found true, though every man be found a liar. For it is written that thou might be justified in thy words and might prevail when thou art judged. This is just the bedrock of who God is. He's a just God. <clears throat> but what is this underlying assumption then in this charge? If God is righteous, catch this, he must take into account human pedigree. He must take into account human effort, work, ethnicity, the faith, the activities of mankind. If he's righteous, he's got to take that into account in his election. That's the only way that God can ever be just. Take man and his doings and who he is out of this, and you have a God who's not just. He's not righteous is what the charge is in this passage. What an answer Paul's going to give to us this morning. 
But before we look at that in, in Exodus that Paul's going to quote, there's one really big foundation that must be laid to understand the beauty and the fullness of what is for us this morning. So this worked deep in my own heart, and I pray it will in yours. <clears throat> what is the righteousness then that's being talked about right here? The kind that God is being accused of not having. This is not the righteousness that we've been spending years and years, two years, working to show you there's a, a righteousness that can justify you before God. Jesus' righteousness put to your account. But this is the righteousness that we dealt with back in Romans 3. Will you flip back to Romans 3 with me? <clears throat> I just want to park on this just for a second because I think it's crucial for what we're looking at this morning. And do you remember when Paul summarized all that he was writing of the depravity of man in Romans 3.23? He said, for all have sinned, <coughs> excuse me, and fall short of the glory of God. And so what, what, do, we, what do we do here is we, we have people who who have been created to bear image of God, to reflect God. And the fall came, and now we want to be God, and we want to put creation as God. And so we've, we've totally suppressed what everything is about, the glory of God. The most important and beautiful thing in the universe, God, we've put ourselves in that place. <laughs> That's the, the definition of depravity. You've put yourself in the place that only God belongs to have. We've belittled and we've defamed the glory and the worth of God. And now God takes ones like that. Sorry, I turned on it. He takes ones like that, and look what he does in verse 24. Now we're justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus. And so now God takes these sinners who lack the glory of God and have suppressed it, and he declares, you're righteous. You're right with God. And so the question is, how can he do that? How, how can God do that with people who have belittled his glory all of their lives? How can he take them now and just say, you're right. You're, you're righteous. You're mine. He passed over. He tells us how he could do that. Verse 25 whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. That was to demonstrate his righteousness. That's the kind we're looking at this morning. His righteousness, because in the forbearance of God, he passed over sins previously committed for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. So, so that is what was going on there and, and God uh, upheld his righteousness to show you, I didn't just pass over sins. I didn't just ignore the sins of David when he raped uh, uh, Bathsheba and killed Uriah. I, 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 I uh, was going to punish him all on my son. And so the righteousness of God is put back on display that he doesn't ignore sin. He doesn't just look past people who have belittled his glory, but he shows his glory at the cross to say, wow. God hates sin, and he loves his glory because he put his son in that place for us. So that is what is at stake here. Flip back to Romans 9. If God chooses whom he wishes, not based on anything in them, that is unrighteous. That's the same claim in Romans 3. This is a God who is not fair. He's not consulting man, and he's making choices based on nothing within us unrighteous is the charge. And so do we have a big answer like Romans 3, like the cross of Jesus Christ? Yes, we do. But before I give it, we are at a crossroad in this question. There are only a few things uh, that we can do at this point. And so you come to it, and, and, and here's what I, I saw all week. You can change the interpretation. This isn't talking about individuals, it's talking about nations. Jacob and Esau representing nations, and the whole Romans just falls apart if you want to do that. Because it's been written to individuals who come to faith and believe, and it's Jacob and it's Esau, and before they're born, they're children. And, and to try to pull that out and say, nope, it, it isn't dealing with individuals, it's just dealing with nations. <clears throat> it just will ruin the whole letter and all the natural interpretation of what's going on in this passage. The other is to say God chooses based on those who will believe. And we looked at that, that prescience view. God looks down the corridors of time. He saw who would believe and he chose them. 
The only problem is, as Paul said, they weren't born as before they had done anything good or bad. And verse 16, it does not depend on the man who wills, free will, choosing, or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. So you just rip it out of its text again, trying to get rid of it. Or we can say that makes God unjust. And we know God is just, so this can't be. So I'm just going to keep moving. I did that for probably 15 years. Many are called, but few are chosen. What does that mean? And I just would go on to the next passage. And so you could just say, that's too big for me. I don't want to think about this. I just want to keep moving. Uh, I want to explain it away that way. Or I agree, if this makes God unjust, it's of absolute wrong interpretation. So to say that God is unjust is a horrific cry. And some of you have a hair trigger, hair, I'll get it. Hair trigger finger, is that it? Help me, Carl. <laughs> and you're just ready to shoot anything. And you're just ready to shoot God. And every time something comes in your life, he's unjust. And just, I want you to be slower to bring that accusation to the just one. And so my question, is God just in what we've been studying in Romans 9, 6 through 13 and choosing based on his own free desire and free will? And here's Ken's answer, and then I'm going to give God's. I like his a lot better. My answer is all human beings deserve hell and not heaven. In Romans 3.10, there's none righteous, no, not even one. There's none who does good. There's none who seek for God. And so when we start crying for justice, we need to be careful. Because if the justice of God were to operate without regard to any other factor, he could do nothing but send every human being to hell. And so if all you want is justice, we all perish. And so I want you to be careful with that cry. Second, if anyone is ever saved, then it must be by mercy alone. Deserving is based on what people have done. Mercy has nothing to do with what people have done. It finds its source this morning, you're going to see in God alone. Mercy is what makes God God, is nothing uh, binds him to show mercy. It's the freest act he could ever do. And we'll see it in Exodus 33 this morning. It says, I'll have compassion and mercy upon whom I desire. Compassion is recognizing the poor or helpless state of a person and stooping to help that person. Mercy is the same, but, but it, it is shown not only to those who don't deserve it, but they deserve the opposite. So it isn't that we even deserved mercy. We deserved wrath. We, we didn't deserve mercy. Mercy is giving salvation to people who deserved to perish. Given heaven to those who merited hell. Mercy is the most beautiful thing, and God's going to show you that's his glory, to show mercy to whom he will. And this gift is done in perfect justice, as we just saw in Romans 3, by putting his son up on a cross. Now God can freely give mercy to all without violating justice. Beautiful. And my third part is if God should save people on the basis of something in them, so what I want to say is their faith or their good works, this would actually be injustice. Because people's backgrounds, I want you to get this, they're unequal. If, if done on the basis of works, it could never be just. <clears throat> if you were raised by loving, moral parents who taught you about God your whole life, or like I said last week, raised by Satanists who taught you to hate God all of your days, that's not fair. There's different temperaments. There's different environments. Some who are just more trusting than others, and some are more skeptical. I can see it on your faces when I'm preaching which one you are. Some get biblical teaching, and others never get it. If God's election were based on the ability of some to respond to him by faith, God would be unjust. Some would be disadvantaged, and others would be privileged. So it's interesting that what you're crying for would be unjust if God were to do it that way. Election is the only thing that is just. It starts with people all at the same point, on the same level, everyone who deserves hell, and it saves some, and it passes over others. Entirely apart from anything, whatever, in these elect or reprobate persons that we saw last week, 
It's just. And that old illustration is, say, 20 convicts are brought before a judge who have committed murder, and 19 receive the death sentence, and this one guy on the left, the judge never met him before, and he says, you can go free. What did that one get? Well, he got mercy. And the other 19 got justice. They got what they deserved. And we're going to look at this morning that mercy is not what we deserve. And the freeness of God is to show it to unworthy sinners like you and me. It's a beautiful thing. Shouldn't God show mercy to everyone? That's what I hear a lot. Show it to everyone, then God. That implies obligation. That ruins the whole passage we're going to look at. If there's any should or have to, it's no longer mercy. It's compelled. And that's going to be at the, the heart of the whole argument. I have a friend who was a prosecuting attorney, and he said everyone he ever dealt with never cried for justice. <laughs> they always said, well, mercy. But our God is merciful. And he will have mercy on whom he will have mercy. And that's what makes his mercy mercy. It's free. It's not bound. It's not earned. It's not merited. It's a gift. And he will give it to whomever he wishes. Glory of God. Right there. This is what makes God, God. So what is God's righteousness? I want to borrow from John Piper. He said, God's righteousness is his unwavering commitment to uphold the honor of his name and the greatness of his glory. And that's what we saw in Romans 3. An unwavering commitment to uphold the honor of his name and the greatness of his glory by what he did on Calvary. It's to uphold the most valuable thing, himself and his glory, and then act in accordance with it. So everything that God does, the righteousness will be based on acting out of the most precious, beautiful thing in the world, the glory of God himself. The glory of God is the most valuable thing. And that he says that's how election accords with his purpose in verse 11. This is the only way they're going to marry is through this. And so I want you to hear this. There is no unrighteousness in election. This is the heart and essence of righteousness. Election is acting for his glory alone. It is so that as we trace the gospel, and we've been tracing it, all of its roots keep going down into the righteousness of God, whether it was an eternity past or eternity future, redemption, justification, it all goes into grace. There's never a part of that chain of grace that you get outside now and bring in man. And so I just want you to see that this whole salvation, always whatever angle you look at the diamond, is the grace of God, and it gives glory to God. From any, any angle, it's just always God. I love Romans 4.16. Let me read that to you again. That was my kind of a, almost a life verse. For this reason, then, the gospel to be justified is by faith, in order that it might accord with grace, so that the promise will be guaranteed. And so we saw that in Romans 4, 16. I got a gospel of grace. God does it all. I want to give it to you. And he says, unless it's by faith, it can't work. So the only way grace and wanting to give it freely to us, the only way it'll ever work is with faith. You not doing anything. Bring works in and you ruin the whole thing. So the only way it'll work is faith and grace. And that's what we're looking at. Free unconditional election only accords with grace. Same concept. Election is the freeness of God. It's his glory. It's his grace on display, his name, his salvation. Remember last week? His purpose. The main purpose of God for everything is his glory, and his glory is put on display by this amazing grace. His freedom is to be unfettered by any human restraints, his choosing without consulting us or depending on us. His righteousness is to uphold his name, and election does that where what man is crying for undoes his righteousness and his glorious plan of grace to add themselves in it. Simply put, the freedom of God is the essence of his glory. Thus, to elect whom he will give this salvation is true righteousness. Is God unjust? No, this is how he is righteous. This is the manifestation of God's righteousness. So the, uh, Piper said, the deepest meaning of divine righteousness 
is his unwavering commitment then to act to uphold his glory. He, he will act for his glory. And election puts that on display. So let's go to our text and watch this glory and beauty be worked out. Look in verse 15. Four, here's our argument. You better defend that. Is there any justice with God? No way. Never impossible. Four, here's, here's how I can say that. He says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So if you'll flip over to Exodus 33. If you got your Bibles, turn there because we need to just park here. Exodus 33, we're going to start in verse 19. And he said, no, I'm sorry. In verse 19, he said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you. And so the context here is God has appeared to Moses, and he wants him to lead his people out of slavery from the Egyptians to a promised land flowing with milk and honey. And we have all these 10 plagues and all that's been going on. Uh, start in chapter 33, verse 1. Then the Lord God spoke to Moses, Depart and go up from here, you and the people whom you have brought up from the land of Egypt, to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying to your descendants, I will give it everything we've been studying in Romans 9. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, Hivite, and Jebusite. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in your midst because you're an obstinate people, and I might destroy you on the way. I'm not going to go with you, you stiff-necked people. I might kill you on the way up because you just got done with the golden calf. So I'm going to stay back. That's your only safe place. There's a lot to that. We'll look at that another day. So Moses now intercedes and come with me in the middle of his prayer, verse 15. <clears throat> then he said to him, Moses, God, if your presence does not go with us, do not lead us up from here. This is what I love about Moses. I don't even want to go if you're not with us. For how then can it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? We're, we're your people, God. It is not... It is not by your going with us so that we, uh, I and your people, may be distinguished from all the other people who are upon the face of the earth. And so Moses is saying, we want your presence, God. I don't want to go if we don't have your presence. And the Lord says in verse 17, Moses, I, I also do this thing of which you have spoken, for you have found favor in my sight, and I have known you by name. And then Moses said, I pray you, show me your glory. God, I want, to see your, I want to see your glory. And look what he says in verse 18. He said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. That's the glory of God. And then I want you to look at verse 34 when it happens in verse 5. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him as he called upon the name of the Lord. And then the Lord passed by in front of him, and here he proclaimed his glory. The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in hessedness, loving kindness and truth. He keeps loving kindness for thousands and forgives iniquity and transgression and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren on the third and fourth generation. Go back to Romans chapter 9. There's kind of this Hebrew idiom. It's called Adam for Adam. And what it meant in this I will have mercy upon whom I'll have mercy and I'll have compassion upon whom I have compassion. It meant no conditions or stipulations. You're just free to do whatever you want. And so God is free, his very glory, to show mercy to whom he wants and to show compassion to whom he wants. 
There's no obligation or indebtedness. It's freely given, and that's the glory of God. So what we're looking at this morning is the glory of our God to show mercy to whom he desires and to have compassion upon whom he desires. In fact, it's used in a very similar way. If, if you'll flip back, sorry, I'm flipping you all over the place this morning. Go back to Exodus. Uh, Joel read it this morning, but I just want to look at it quickly one more time. Exodus 3. <clears throat> Since he read it, I'm just going to take up in verse 10. Is he's going to come say, Moses, I, I want you to lead these people out. And, and I'm going to be the one. And, and Moses is just saying, well, who are you? Who do I tell the people is, is doing this? Um, so Exodus 3, we have the burning bush. And he says, well, you know, what is your name? What's your name? Um, and let's just go to verse 13. Then Moses said to God, behold, I'm going to the sons of Israel. And I'll say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And now they may say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent you. I am who I am. We're right back at it. My being, my freedom. I am who I am. I'm not a created one. No one tells me how to be God. I'm free. I am that I am. No job description has ever been given to God. I am. No one ever gave me existence. I am self-existent, free from all. So how does a God, for that, with that much freedom, how does he act? Well, he acts for his glory. And his glory is, I will have mercy upon whom I will have mercy. And he is free in his essence and being to act this way. There are no conditions or restraints that make him act this way. Pure freedom. I am who I am. I show mercy to whom I show mercy. This is my glory. That's just the way it is. You are God and God alone. Whew. So the glory of God, his righteousness to act for that glory, always doing what's right for the highest thing, is to act for his name's sake, to put on display the grace of God to the praise of his glory and grace and fallen sinners. To uphold that name, I am rather than being unjust in election, it's the very essence of his justice and his glory. Rug pulled out. This little challenge from unrighteous beings toward God that's unjust brings an answer that is so weighty. It should bring all of us to our faces this morning. This is the glory of God and the righteousness of God. To have mercy on whom he chooses. And I can't compel him to choose me. We don't like that. You just took away my glory. Just look into the glory of God this morning. Maybe just a little application. Go back to Romans. I promise that's the last time you flip this morning. Unless you flip in your seat with some of the things I'm about to say. What did Paul tell us in Romans 3 that the law was supposed to do? He says to shut our mouth. Shut our mouth before God. And what is, what is faith alone to do in Romans 3.27? Where is boasting? It's excluded. By what kind of law of works? No, but by a law of faith. We maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. And so where's boasting? Excluded. In this gospel, there's no boasting. It's Jesus Christ put on display and all who will believe and look to him will be saved. There's nothing in you. The cross is to silence our boasting and leave us naked and empty and giving glory to God for free mercy and all that he has done, nothing in me. Well, what is election to do? We looked at it last week, Romans 1, 27 to 31. Where then is there boasting? There's not many wise, mighty, or noble. God just chose the weak and the poor and the lame. 
He says it just causes no boasting before God. As you sit here this morning, I hope you just sit here going, there's nothing in me that makes me better than anyone else. There's no boasting. God and his goodness interrupted my life and opened my eyes and brought me to Jesus Christ savingly. I'm done boasting. There's nothing in me. It was all of God. And he, he entered and he came and got me. He sought me when a stranger. And what is the cross supposed to do? Take away all boasting. So I boast only in the cross of Christ my Lord. The application is be done with us. Give God glory for this whole salvation from the cross to that it's by faith to that it's electing love and just begin to realize that it is just all he showed mercy upon whom he will show mercy and I had nothing to draw him closer just away from me. Marvel at a God like this. I like what he said to Moses, take your shoes off, you're on holy ground. Huh? This is holy ground. One commentator said, God's glory in his name consists fundamentally in his propensity to show mercy and his sovereign freedom in its distribution. Another one said, it's the glory of God in his essential nature, mainly to dispense mercy on whomever he pleases, apart from any constraint originating outside of his own will. This is the essence of what it means to be God, and this is what his name is. And the way that's proven to me as I look at the cross of Christ, and that is the lengths that God would go so that he could show me mercy and not be unrighteous and not violate his justice. He'd put his own son up on a cross so he could give me mercy and stay true to his glory and who he is, his justice. Mercy incarnate. I'm just going to read you a couple verses to take this in and we'll close out. Isaiah 55, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord and he will have compassion on him. And to our God, he will abundantly pardon. Repent, turn, God will show mercy upon you. And then he says this, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, Neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts your thoughts. And we have butchered that verse so many times in the Christian church. What are his thoughts that aren't our thoughts? He'll show mercy if you turn to him in Christ. The very glory of God, I will show mercy if you turn. That is where his thoughts are not like our thoughts. It's going to finish up this whole section in Romans eleven thirty two. 32. God has shut up all in disobedience, Jew and Gentile, that he, he might show mercy to all. He, he loves to show mercy. It's his glory. And his whole working in history is to show mercy to all. How about Romans 10? I'm just gonna, we're going to get there eventually. Verse 12, there's no distinction between Jew and Greeks. For the same Lord is the Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who will call upon him. For whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. He's just abounding in riches and mercy and love and kindness for all who will call. I'm thinking of David when he sinned with Bathsheba. Be gracious to me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. According to the greatness of thy compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. God, your glory is to show mercy to sinners. And man, he knew it. And David got it. I remember when he, when he, when he numbers the troops and God says, you're going to get punishment for that, David. There are three things you can choose. You can have seven years of famine, three months while your foes pursue you, or three days of pestilence in your land. And in 2 Samuel 24, David said to God, I am in great distress. Let us not fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great. Uh, I'm sorry, let us now fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great. It's amazing what one letter will do. <laughs> but do not let me fall into the hand of man. Man isn't merciful. Don't let me fall into the hand of men. Let me fall into the hand of God because I know he's merciful. They understood the glory of God. 
I've been just thinking about the history of the world is a bunch of cults and philosophies of trying to bind God by our acts and our efforts. And the very glory of God is to show mercy to whom he desires. So I want you to walk away with this. Don't go up to God and say, you know what, I've decided to accept your forgiveness. I want you smiting your breast and cry to God and say, be merciful to me, the sinner. I'm nothing but a sinner. I have nothing to merit. God, would you show me mercy? And that's the one who goes away justified. I'm crying for your glory, God. Forgive me of my sins. What did God say to Moses? Take your shoes off. You're on holy ground. Let's finish in Romans 9, 16 then. So then. Our application, so then. It does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. And I keep laughing, saying, Moses, why don't, or Paul, why don't you just say it straight? Tell us what you think. To, to make it any other way will steal from the very glory and name of God. If you make this mercy hang upon your willing or your running, you've stripped God from the godness of God. The word wills, it concerns volition. It's not according to your volition, your free will, your humanism. And it's not on those who run, your, your exertion, your acts, your goodness. That isn't it. Those are not going to bring God's mercy. Neither of these are what are the cause of what saved us. It's the mercy of God, he says in verse 16. So I want to clarify something really important as we close out. And, and this is what I hear the most, and that's why I want to keep addressing it each week. There's a choice that must be made. There's a choice of a life that must be surrendered and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We've spent two years on that. Scripture says, anyone who comes to me will be saved. All who believe will be saved. Whosoever comes, whoever confesses will be saved. And I want you to hear this real clearly. That is the exercise of your free will. And so I choose to believe. I choose to come to Christ. I surrender. I repent. Scripture teaches this. Everyone who comes, confesses, believes, repents, will be saved. And that's from your free will. Some of you are so uncomfortable right now, and you need to be. Man has a free will. God designed us that way. But we're not free moral agents. <clears throat> a free moral agent would be Adam and Christ. But man is not neutral. Romans 1 through 3, we parked on it. Romans 5, the, the, the sin of Adam's imputed, and we come in twisted and bent. We're not a free moral agent. There's no neutrality in humanity, meaning you cannot choose anything other than according to your nature. Your free will will always choose what your nature wants and desires. It will always choose that. A bird is free to choose to fly, but not to swim. So what is the problem with fallen man? <clears throat> he will only choose to sin. He will only choose his own works to get right with God. He'll always choose his own glory. Romans 3.23, you're always going to choose that. It's all you think about all day long. You love your sin and you're at enmity with God and all the law does is stir it up. We saw in Romans 6 and 7. So my question is, how can you choose that which you don't love, that which you don't treasure or delight in, to be your all and all? When it says, none who seek for God, and Jesus said, no one can come to the Father unless he draws him. I do not cho you do not choose me, but I chose you in John 15, 16, 1 Corinthians 2, 14. The natural man can't understand the things of God. You'll never get it. You'll never be able to read the Bible enough and figure it out in your own natural Abilities. You, you have a free will, but you're going to keep choosing sin yourself and away from God unless sovereign grace comes into your life and opens your eyes and makes you willing. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. That's a free will. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man but of God. 
You were born of God, and that's why you received him and believed in him. In Romans 9, 16, it doesn't depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. It's the mercy of God that you believe this morning. It was given to you. It was the freeness of God to show mercy to whom he wishes and whom he desires. So that is why I can beg men and women to believe in Jesus Christ and be saved. If you've come here this morning, you need to believe in Christ and be saved from the wrath that is to come. God sent his son into the world and killed him in our place so we could be forgiven of sins because he's merciful and he's righteous. So he punished his son so that you could be forgiven freely and shown mercy for all the sins that you've done this morning. That's why I can tell you, use your free will this morning. Choose Jesus. Come to him. Surrender. Because I never know where the Spirit's going to blow in open eyes. And this morning you might get the call and you might believe for the first time in your life. Oh, what I've seen over the decades. I've seen Greeks come to Christ. I've seen barbarians, Satan worshipers, reformed kids, moral kids, religious kids, even kids with chicken pox, addicts. I've seen them all come to Jesus Christ. Because I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God to bring you into salvation. And so here's the hope. God has entered this world to save. It's his glory. His glory is for you to repent and believe in Jesus. Look away from you fixing yourself up, being religious, being good. It just steals his glory. Come and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and give glory to God and be saved this morning. So free, there's free mercy of God in election. It makes me want to preach the gospel and beg sinners all the more. The more I get this, the more I have hope to preach and beg and plead Jesus Christ to your souls. I know what Moses saw. I will have mercy upon whom I will have mercy. And because of the nature and the name of God, he will save all who come to him and give life. So the doctrine is man's willing and running do not determine the bestowal of God's mercy. But on the contrary, God's mercy determines man's willing and man's working. To him alone be the glory. I was praying when we would finish, it would just be the aroma of God up here. I can't get over a God who's like this. And I love that you guys have been brought into this mercy. Treasure it, drink it, get yourself out of everything. and Just go deep and give glory to God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this glory and this beauty. God, I thank you that you act. I thank you that you act for your glory. You work to the highest end, everything in this universe. And it's all unto your glory and showing free sovereign grace to unworthy sinners. And God, I thank you that you are not bound by anything in us. So you, it won't be taken off of us because we can't get it unbound by what we do, say, think. Thank you, God. What a beautiful gospel. And so we, we, we just give you all the praise and glory. And each one of us, Lord, can testify how you hunted us down. And you opened our eyes and you drew us sweetly to Christ. And the most free thing I ever did was believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. God, thank you for making me willing to you be the glory forever and ever. And all God's people said,